Okay, so what I'm gonna focus on in the next 10 or 15 minutes is um, gaining access for retroperitoneal surgery. So this is um, kind of the mystery that everybody uh, kind of shakes their head at and say, well, how do you, how do you make this space? Where are you? Um, how do you keep from you know, getting lost? So I'm gonna show you some of the things that we've um, developed since 2006. So I did the first retroperitoneal robotic partial here in 2006, and that was with a giant robot. That was the standard robot, and there was very little space, but the robots have gotten better, and it's actually made the retroperitoneal approach um, even better. I know some of my colleagues do this, some of my colleagues don't do this. Ronnie, where are you today with retro? You love it now, okay. <laughs> this time last year, <laughs> you wouldn't have been saying love, but you love it now. Awesome, great to hear. And Kate, and I know you do this. I like it. Yeah, Jonathan? Like, not like. Like? <laughs> You're gonna make you love it. Tim, what about you? You like it? You love it. Okay, you will love it. Um, so, how many here do retro right now in the, in the audience? Okay, great. How many wanna do it but are not, you know, sure they can? Okay, all right. Um, so, here's my disclosures. Um, so, I'm gonna go over the patient position for this. Hello, Brian. Um, creating space, uh, port configuration, docking, and something I call fat management. Fat management's not well, not often talked about, but I think it's a key component to doing a good retroperitoneal surgery. And then I'm gonna show you both the SI and the XI. How many here have an SI? Still using an SI, good. How many have an XI? All right, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll approach both. So the patient position is the same for the XI and the SI. It's a full flank position. The idea here is to open the space between the 12th rib and the iliac crest, so you wanna fully flex the patient. I don't use the kidney rest. All I do is make sure that the patient's umbilicus is at the break in the bed, and then we fully flex them. So here's what it looks like. I use tape and rolls. You don't need to put anybody on a bean bag. That's hard. This is a this is a very kind of pressure point position. So a bean bag, I don't think is a good idea when you're flexing somebody maximally like this. This is just to show you that I put the break at the umbilicus. That's where I think we get the best break. And I will back up a little bit. So you'll get the occasional woman who's very hippy, who has a very large hip. And that can be a problem because your ports are right against the iliac crest. What do you do about that? What you should do is you should move the brake even a little farther cephalad, okay? So that means the umbilicus is below the brake now. What that will do is it will drop the hip down when you flex him, and it'll make that, that very hippie person a little less hippie. It's still there, but it's, it's less if you move them a little, um, if you move the brake up a little bit. And again, this just shows we use blankets and uh, pillows. Now, this is an important uh, photo because one of the key uh, points about making that space is where the shoulder and the hip are when you flex them. If you don't have the hip and shoulder in alignment before you flex them, then the patient is going to do one of two things. If the shoulder's ahead of the hip and you flex them, they're gonna bend forward. And if the shoulder's behind the hip and you flex them, they're gonna bend backward. So it's important the shoulder and hip are in a line and that the back is straight up and down. If you have those two things before you flex, you're gonna get that maximal space. So creating the space we do with a balloon. Uh, we put the balloon uh, basically in the retroperitoneal space um, digitally, and then basically the kidney is being pushed anteriorly. The balloon that I use is this kind of football, rugby-shaped balloon. There's a round balloon, but it doesn't really create the space as well. Um, this is the balloon that I like, and the round balloon just doesn't create enough space. Now, um, if you're using the SI, um, this is the Hassan cannula that I would use. This is a basically a balloon port that has a sponge collar on top, um, and what it does is it creates a nice seal because you're making a cut down incision, so there's a lot of um, possibility of leaking CO2 there, but this balloon port does a great job in keeping that from leaking. This is another version of that made by Applied. It works as well. It's got a, instead of a foam collar, it's got a little gel collar. Um, that works just as well. And so for the SI, historically, I used a three-port configuration, and that's because the SI was a lot bigger and you didn't have as much space. And we were able to do pretty much every procedure with three arms. Um, so I have my uh, assistant in the anterior axillary line, and then um, the, the, you can see the camera and ports are somewhat offset, about eight centimeters apart. And this is what it looked like in real time. So uh, camera in the anterior, in the mid-axillary line, my assistant and the right robotic arm in this case in the anterior axillary line and then the left arm in the posterior axillary line. Docking for the SI, because of its size, really required docking over the patient's head parallel to the spine. 
Notice that robot, that's a standard robot. That was many years ago. Um, and so you needed to dock this way in order to get the arms separated far enough so that you didn't have arm collision. That's all changed with the XIs. But there are limitations in the three-arm technique. Basically, it's one-handed surgery because I'm usually holding up the kidney with one hand or doing something with one hand and then dissecting with the other. So it's what, it's what we did laparoscopically. So um, that was not a big switch stretch for me because I did a lot of laparoscopic surgery. But it's not the best way to do surgery. Two-handed surgery is always better if you can do it. The three-arm technique with the SI also had a lot of arm conflict. And if you, didn't, if you had a very small patient, you had a lot of conflict and then um, your exposure wasn't always good. The other issue is if you put a hole in the peritoneum, that was a problem because all of a sudden your already small space was even smaller. So what we did is we transitioned to the Da Vinci XI and we started using a forearm approach because these arms are actually allow a much tighter arm configuration. The arms can be put closer together. So you can get these small arms in a very small space. It also allowed uh, flexibility with docking. You didn't have to dock over the head, you could dock over the side. So it's a forearm technique, as you can see here. Now, it's, it's not as much staggered, it's more of an arc. And it's not completely linear, I like more of this arc. And the reason I like the arc is it allows me to get my fourth arm more, in, uh, more cephalad. Why is that important? It gives my assistant more space. If you did more of a straight line, then your assistant and that fourth arm are gonna be on top of each other, and your assistant can be handcuffed. And, that's, and, he, and he's very important. Uh, in your procedure. About six centimeters is all you need, but you know you can go down as low as four, and you can go up as much as eight if you want. And then I do think you need some space between the assistant and the most anterior port. And again, I show you the arc. Now notice the right arm and the fourth arm. It, it's, it's important because if you think about what, what's the fourth arm doing most of the case, it's actually retracting the kidney up. Well, that means on the outside it's coming down. And in certain cases, in certain patients, if the arm is down, it will be on the assistant. So we've discovered this, and in certain cases, we've changed the right arm and the fourth arm. So what that means is we've actually moved our fourth arm inside and put our working right arm on the outside. What's the right arm doing most of the case? It's pointing down. So that means on the outside of the patient, it's up. So this is just an adjustment. You don't have to do it in everyone, but it's an adjustment that will actually, if, you have, if you're doing a case and your assistant ha is completely handcuffed and they can't move because the fourth arm is on top of them, just do that little switch. Now, there is some implications when you do that. And if your fourth arm is holding up, that means your right hand arm has to be working inside of that. So when you're inside the body, you have to keep that in mind because you will get internal conflict if you make that change. So um, how do we gain the access? This applies um, to the XI, but we make an incision in the mid-axillary line. And then basically I pop through the lumbodosal fascia with a tonsil clamp. And then once I'm in the retroperitoneum, it's very soft and you feel the, sometimes you feel the lower pole of the kidney, you feel the iliac crest. It's a very soft space so you know you're in. Once we make the space, we put this balloon dilator in and the balloon dilator has a little obturator, which we use to kind of bring it in even, even more. And that allows us to get the balloon in place. Now notice the orientation of that balloon. That's not a mistake. There are two valves that face, that are on one side of this balloon. The balloon expands perpendicular to those valves. And that's, you want that balloon expanding parallel to the psoas muscle, along the psoas muscle. If you rotate that balloon so that those, those valves are facing the patient's head or the foot, the balloon will expand in that direction, and that's not the direction you want. So we purposely have those two valves on this balloon facing the assistant so that it expands in that direction. That is a, a minor detail, but it's, it makes a big difference. Now, this is a 10 millimeter balloon, and we have an eight millimeter XI scope. How do we make this balloon work? We just put a robotic port, an XI port inside the balloon, it creates a seal, and then you can expand the balloon. And here's what it looks like when the balloon unfurls. So the balloon's unfurling, my assistant's pumping the balloon. Usually they're counting. Um, it's usually between 50 and 60, sometimes more. What we're trying to do, if you're, just, if you're not sure how much to expand, you wanna get all the folds out of the balloon. So the balloon has folds in it, and eventually, once you expand it, all those folds go away, and you know you have enough expansion, okay? Once we, uh, we get our space created, we put a port in. Now, this is the old version. I'm showing you all these versions of our evolution. We just did a little purse string, 
around here, put the eight millimeter in, and it created a nice seal. So as opposed to using a sponge collar or a balloon port, you can just do a suture, no big deal. This is also what, something we experimented with. So this is the old Hassan balloon patrol car, and I put an eight millimeter inside there. And it works, and you don't lose seal, but there's a problem. And the problem uh, was alerted to me by the, and the engineers at Intuitive. They came up to watch us doing this on a, on a retro case. And I did this, and they said, do you know that could be a problem? I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you are setting up a situation for capacitive coupling. And I said, well, why? I said, I'm fully aware that if I put a monopolar instrument down a situation like this, so capacitive coupling occurs in this situation because that metal port is not in contact with the body. It's being insulated by that balloon trocar. So if you put a monopolar current down that metal port, the laws of physics say that some current will actually build up in your metal port. That's not a problem if that metal port's touching the patient's skin because that current can go back to the grounding pad. So you don't have any current buildup. But if you do this and you have a monopolar or scissor down there, for example, a hot shears down there, current can build up. And so we all know this from laparoscopic surgery where capacitive coupling actually resulted in inadvertent bowel injury and inadvertent current being conducted to places you didn't want it. So I said, so why is this happening? Why would this happen with a camera down there? I said, oh, this is a digital camera. There's a, there's a chip in the tip of that scope. There's actually current going down that scope. It's a, not a lot of current. It's not monopolar current, but it's current, all right? So we got rid of this, just so you know. So if you want to do this, so this technique is called a hybrid port technique. It was popularized during NephroU with the SI. Many people talked about it and did it, but actually, depending on what instrument you put down there, it can create a, a capacitive coupling situation. So this is what we use now. This is a robotic Hassan, and I really like it because it does, it does a great job of sealing. It's actually meant for this port. Intuitive created this. And I don't even have to suture it in. There's little ports to suture it in, but all you need to do is push it in and the robotic arm, because it's fixed in space, it just holds it against the patient's body and it's a great seal. So this is what we use going forward. Now, once we get our first port, our camera in, the first port we always put in is the posterior port. And we put that in underneath the 12th rib um, in the posterior axillary line. And again, we put this in and I like to use a tonsil clamp to show me where I'm gonna come through and then we just bring the port in. And I also like the tonsil clamp because it kind of pre-dilates the port, and I like the blunt obturator so you don't have to push as hard. It, it pre-dilates for you. And once we get that posterior port in, this is how we create more space. Now, with a forearm technique, you need to make some space anteriorly to get this port in. So this is what I'm doing. I've got a blunt laparoscopic instrument um, through that posterior port, and then this is what it looks like on the inside. So what I'm pushing off is the peritoneum. So the transversus abdominis muscle is above, the peritoneum is below, and I'm creating enough space here to get more ports in. So I'm gonna push this off until I'm looking for about 12 to 13 centimeters from my camera port to the edge of the peritoneum. That's kind of my, my landmark. So that means I get about six to six and a half centimeters between the ports. My camera, when I'm doing this, by the way, is rotated 30 degrees up. So I have a 30 degree lens in now. I'm rotating up so I can see this well. It's hard to do that with 30 down, but with 30 up, it's no problem. And then once we, we make our space, this is my most anterior port going in. So my assistant, again, is just poking through with a tonsil, going through the muscle, and then it shows you exactly where you need to go. And I'm gonna show you all, all this today, but I think seeing this now is gonna make what you can't see during this operation today less uh, of a concern. So there's the first port, and now the assistant. So you can see my assistant's near the anterior superior X spine. You actually have to create a space for the assistant as well. We like the air seal port. I think for retroperitoneal surgery, when you have a very small space, so what do I mean by small space? So when you insufflate somebody transperitoneally, an average male, to 15 millimeters of mercury, it's four and a half to five liters in that space. Same 15 millimeters of mercury in this space is one and a half liters, okay? That's a much smaller space. What does that mean? If your assistant is aggressive and they suck, they can deflate your space very, very quickly. Air seal keeps up with that. Air seal allows you to suck in a very small space and not um, you know, not lose your vision. So we think it's very, very helpful for retroperitoneal. Who makes the air seal? ConMed. Okay. There are my disclosures. Um, docking is much easier with the XI. You don't have to dock over the head. You can dock from the side, you can dock from the foot, you can dock any direction you like. All we do is we don't do any targeting. We put the X on the camera, 
We rotate the line so it's parallel to my ports, and then we bring the ports down, and that's it. There's no targeting necessary. Um, I don't target at all. I haven't targeted since we started just using, putting the laser line on the camera port, and then if you just rotate the horizontal line so it's parallel with your ports, you're good. And then this is what it looks like. So um, we have our camera, and this is a zero degree lens for, for retro. Um, I find the zero works the best. So this is what it looks like on the, uh, on the outside. This is what it looks like afterwards. We extract through the camera port, so you can see that incision is a bit larger, so we extract our, our, our specimen through that incision. As I mentioned, docking can be any direction. I don't need to show you that. Oh, why are we doing that again? Okay, fat management. So fat management is important because depending on how big your patient is, they can have more or less retroperitoneal fat. Most women have very little retroperitoneal fat or have a small amount. Um, and that's because most women carry their fat between their skin and their fascia. Men carry their fat between their fascia and their organs as a, as a protective mechanism, I imagine. So most men are gonna have a lot more retroperitoneal fat. The retroperitoneal fat, uh, again, this gets back to being oriented and understanding what's going on in the retroperitoneum. You can divide it into two large categories. The perinephric fat, which is outside your otis fascia, and the PERI nephric fat, which is inside your otis fascia. The fat that gets in your way and is a problem is the fat outside your otis fascia, the PARA nephric fat, okay? That's the fat that you need to deal with. That's what's gonna be hanging in your face, and that's what makes you know, people want to go transperitoneal all the time. So, and then this just shows a picture of the two different fat layers. So the fat outside Gerotas is the fat that, that really gets in your way. And I'm going to show it to you here. This is, that white layer is actually Gerotas fascia. So if I have a lot of fat, I'll spend the first 10 minutes taking this fat off and just mobilizing it, and I throw it in the, in the lower retroperitoneum. And when you do that, all of a sudden, this case, which was you know, you can't even see becomes, you know, and then I just push it away, and there's Gerotas, and now I'm making my incision. This is the first move to enter the space. We call that entering the bag, and you enter the space, you, you make an incision above Gerotas, uh, uh, in Gerotas, above the psoas muscle, and that puts you in the space. And that's facilitated, again, by removing that fat. The final thing I wanna talk about is how we're improving imaging, and I know Harsh is gonna show you some of this, but we're actually working with a company called Sivra, um, and it's an it's a, it's a imaging software that allows you to take your patient's CT scan, and you send that to Sivra, and they send you back a 3D model of the patient's um, kidney and tumor and vasculature and collecting system. And what this does is it gives you uh, much more detail than you can get with a standard CT scan or MRI. So the nice thing about this, this can go to your phone. So they send it to your phone. So it's easy, it's, a, it's, much, it's virtually you know, there whenever you need it. And they have a 3D option, so you can put your phone into a 3D viewfinder. And so instead of looking at this in 2D, I like the 3D myself because I think it gives me more detail, more depth. So it's FDA cleared. So here's the model one of the models. So you can see um, very good detail on the vasculature, the collecting system. So here's a tumor on the lower pole, and it gives you, you know, the detail that many of you are now used to seeing with these 3D models. So that's something we're gonna show you on this first case, and, um, and hopefully it's gonna give us um, the, more information. So to conclude, retroperitoneal access is not mysterious. There's actually steps that make this doable. Um, I think it's important to understand the retroperitoneal anatomy, and we clearly like the XI for retroperitoneal because it allows forearm technique, and we think there's benefit to that. So with that, I wanna thank you all for coming to Seattle uh, for the course. Um, I think we're gonna turn it over now to, I think, uh, Caitlin's up next. He's gonna talk to you about transperitoneal, and I'm gonna head over to the OR, okay? Thank you. Thank you.